Greetings once again. I'm Pastor Naomi Barkanik from Spirit of Joy Lutheran Church in Clarkdale. If this is your first time, we are going through the book by Pastor Frederick Beekner called Wishful Thinking. It's really a dictionary of his A to Z definitions, some secular and some theological. And you know, we're working our way through the book, and today we are starting with the word justification. In printer's language, to justify means to set type in such a way that all full lines are of equal length and flush both left and right. In other words, to put the printed lines in the right relationship with the page they're printed on and with each other. The religious sense of the word is very close to this. Being justified means being brought into right relationship. Paul says simply that being justified means having peace with God. That's in Romans 5, verse 1. Underline that in your Bible. Being justified means having peace with God. Romans 5, verse 1. He uses the noun justification for the first step in the process of salvation. During his Pharisee phase, or blue period, Paul was on his way to Damascus to mop up some Christians when suddenly he heard the voice of Jesus Christ, whose resurrection he had up till now considered only an ugly rumor. But what he might have expected then the voice to say was, Just you wait. But what in fact the voice did say was, I want you on my side. Paul never got over it. As far as Paul was concerned, he was the last man in the world for God to have called this way. But God had, thereby revealing himself to be a God who was willing to do business with you even if you were in the process of mopping up Christians at the time. Paul also discovered that all the brownie points he had been trying to rack up as a super Pharisee had been pointless. God did business with you not because of who you were, but because of who he was. All the voice seemed to want Paul to do was to believe that it meant what it said and do as it asked. Paul did both. At a moment in his life when he had le least reason to expect it, Paul was staggered by the idea that no matter who you are or what you've done, God wants you on his side. There is nothing you have to do or be. It's on the house. It goes with the territory. God has justified you lined you up. To feel this somehow in your bones is the first step to a new life. You don't have to hear a voice on the road to Damascus to feel it in your bones either. Maybe just noticing the holy and the grace given to you in your own life. We're on the case. Kingdom of God. It is not a place, of course, but a condition. Kinship might be a better word. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, Jesus prayed. The two are side by side. They're, they're close together. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Insofar as here and there and now and then, God's kingly will is being done in various odd ways among us, even at this moment. The kingdom has come already. 
Insofar as all the odd ways we do his will at this moment are at best half-baked and half-hearted. But the kingdom is still a long way off. A hell of a long way off, to be more precise and theological. As a poet, Jesus is maybe at his best in describing the feeling you get when you glimpse the thing itself, the kingship of the king at last, and all the world his coronation. It's like finding a million dollars in a field, he says, or a jewel worth a king's ransom. It's like finding something you hated to lose and thought you'd never find again. An old keepsake, a stray sheep, a missing child, a lost love. When the kingdom really comes, it's as if the thing you lost and thought you'd never find again can oftentimes be you. Law. There are basically two kinds. One, law is the way things ought to be. And two, law is the way things are. An example of the first is no trespassing. An example of the second is the law of gravity. God's law has traditionally been spelled out in terms of category number one, a compendium of do's and don'ts. These do's and don'ts are the work of moralists, and when obeyed, serve the useful purpose of keeping us from each other's throats. They can't make us human, but they can help keep us honest. God's law in itself, however, comes under category number two, which is the law as the way things are. And it's the work of God. It has been stated in eight words, he who does not love remains in death. That's in 1 John 3, verse 14. Like it or not, that's how it is. If you don't believe it, you can always put it to the test. Just the way if you don't believe the law of gravity, you can always step out a 10th story window. Life. The temptation is always to reduce it to size. A bowl of cherries, a rat race, amino acids, even to call it a mystery smacks of reductionism. Life is the mystery. As far as anybody seems to know, the vast majority of things in the universe do not have whatever life is. Sticks, stones, stars, space, they simply are. A few things are and are somehow alive to it. They have broken through into something or something has broken through into them. Even a jellyfish, a butternut squash, they're in it with us. We're all in it together or it in us. Life is it. Life is with. After lecturing, Learnedly on miracles, a great theologian was asked to give a specific example of one. There is only one miracle, he answered. It is life. Have you wept at anything during the past year? Has your heart beat faster at the sight of young beauty? Have you thought seriously about the fact that someday you are going to die? More often than not, do you really listen when people are speaking to you instead of just waiting for your turn to speak? Is there anybody you know in whose place, if one of you had to suffer great pain, you would volunteer yourself? 
If your answer to all or most of these questions is no, the chances are that you're dead. Light. We can't see light itself. We can only we we can see only what light lights up, like the little circle of night when the candle flickers, a sheen of mahogany, a wine glass, a face leaning towards us out of the shadows. When Jesus says that he is the light of the world, that's in John eight verse twelve. Maybe something like that is part of what he is saying. He himself is beyond our seeing, but in the, in the darkness where we stand, we see, thanks to him, something of the path that stretches out from the door, something of whatever it is that keeps us trying more or less to follow, a path even when we can hardly believe that it goes anywhere worth going or that we have what it takes to go there. Something of whatever it is that every once in a while seems to lean towards us out of the shadows. The Lord's Supper, something that many of us have been missing for months. Pastor Beekner starts out by saying, It is make-believe. You make believe that the one who breaks the bread and blesses the wine is not the plump parson who smells of William's aqua velva, but Jesus of Nazareth. You make believe that the wafer or bread and the wine or grape juice are Jesus' flesh and blood. You make believe that by swallowing them you are swallowing his life into your life and that there is nothing in earth or heaven more important for you to do than this. It's a game you play because he said to play it. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this. Play that it makes a difference. Play that it makes sense. If it seems a childish thing to do, do it in remembrance that you are a child. Remember Max Beerbohm's happy hypocrite? The wicked man who wore the mask of a saint to woo and win the saintly girl he loved. Years later, when a cast-off girlfriend discovered the ruse, she challenged him to take off the mask in front of his beloved and show his face for the, for the sorry thing it was. He did what he was told, only to discover that underneath the saint's mask, his face had become the face of a saint. This same reenactment of the Last Supper is sometimes called the Eucharist, from a Greek word meaning thanksgiving, because the Last Supper itself, Christ gave thanks. And on their part, Christians have nothing for which to be more thankful. It is called Holy Communion because when feeding at this implausible table, Christians believe that they are communing with the Holy One himself. His spirit enlivening their spirits, heating the blood and gladdening the heart, just the way wine as spirits can. They are also, of course, communing with each other. To eat any meal together is to meet at the level of our most basic need. To eat this particular meal together is to meet at the level of our most basic humanness, which involves our need not just for food, but for each other. I need you to help fill my emptiness, just as you need me to help fill yours. 
As for the emptiness that's still left over, well, we're in it together, or it in us. Maybe it's most of us. Maybe it's most of what makes us human and makes us brothers and sisters. The next time you walk down the street, take a good look at every face you pass. And in your mind say, Christ died for thee. Christ died for thee. Christ died for thee. And the next time you partake of the Lord's Supper, might you hear the words, take and eat. Do this in remembrance that Christ died for thee. Love. The first stage is to believe that there is only one kind of love. The middle stage is to believe that there are many kinds of love and that the Greeks had a different word for each of them. The last stage is to believe that there is only one kind of love. The unabashed eros of lovers, the sympathetic philia of friends, agape, agape giving itself away freely no less for the murderer than for his victim. These are all varied manifestations of a single reality. To lose yourself in another's arms, or in another's company, or in suffering for all men who suffer, including the ones who inflict suffering upon you. To lose yourself in such ways as to find yourself, is what it's all about, is what love is. Of all powers, love is the most powerful and the most powerless. It is the most powerful because it alone can conquer that final and most impregnable stronghold, which is the human heart. It is the most powerless because it can do nothing except by consent. To say that love is God is romantic idol idealism. To say that God is love is either the last straw or the ultimate truth. i read that again. To say that love is God is romantic idealism. But to say that God is love is either the last straw or the ultimate truth. In the Christian sense, love is not primarily an emotion, but an act of the will. When Jesus tells us to love our neighbors, he is not telling us to love them in the sense of responding to them with a cozy emotional feeling. You can as easily produce a cozy emotional feeling on demand as you can a yawn or a sneeze. On the contrary, Jesus is telling us to love our neighbors in the sense of being willing to work for their well-being, even if it means sacrificing your own well-being to that end, even if it means sometimes just leaving them alone. Thus, in Jesus' terms, we can love our neighbors without necessarily liking them. In fact, liking them may stand in the way of loving them by making us overprotective instead of reasonab reasonably honest friends. When Jesus talked to the Pharisees, he didn't say, there, there, everything is going to be all right. He said, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? That's in Matthew 12, verse 34. And Jesus said that to them because he loved them. This does not mean that liking may not be a part of loving, only that it doesn't have to be. Sometimes liking follows on the heels of loving. It is hard to work for people's well-being very long. 
without coming in the end to rather like them too. And you know, I want to tell you this, you know, my mom, when we were little girls and, and we had done something wrong and we knew we had done wrong and, you know, we'd go to mom and say, mommy, we're sorry. Do you still love, do you still love us? And she said, I will always love you, but right now I just don't like you. <laughs> the next word is lust. Lust is the craving for salt of a person who is dying of thirst. The last L word, lying. There is perhaps nothing that so marks us as human as the gift of speech. Who knows to what degree and in what ways animals have the power to communicate with each other, but to all appearances it is only a shadow of ours. By speaking we can reveal the hiddenness of thought. We can express the subtlest as well as the most devastating of emotions. We can heal. We can make poems, we can pray, we can hurt. All of which is to say we can speak truth, the truth of what it is to be ourselves, to be with each other, to be in the world. And such speaking as that is close to what being is all, being human is all about. What makes lying an evil is less that the world is mischievously deceived by it than that we are sorely dehumanized by it. Let's try, let's try one, one more. We'll go to magic. We're on the M's. We're getting there. Magic. Magic is saying abracadabra and pulling the rabbit out of the hat. Magic is stepping on a crack to break your mother's back. It's a dashboard Jesus to prevent smash-ups. Magic is going to church so you will get to heaven. Magic is using Listerine so everybody will love you. Magic is a technique of Controlling unseen powers and will always work if you do it by the book. Magic is manipulation and says, my will be done. Religion is propitiation and says, thy will be done. Magic is my will be done. Religion says thy will be done. Religion is praying and maybe the prayer will be answered and maybe it won't. At least not the way you want or when you want and maybe not at all. Even if you do it by the book, religion doesn't always work. As Jesus pointed out in one of his more somber utter utterances when he said, Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. The corollary to which would appear to be, Not everyone who wouldn't be caught dead saying, Lord, Lord, shall be blackballed from the kingdom of heaven. He softened the blow Somewhat then by adding that the way to enter the kingdom of heaven is to do the will of his Father in heaven. But when religion claims that it's always sure that will is, it's only bluffing. Magic is always sure. If security is what you're after, try magic. But if adventure is what you're after, try religion. The line between the two is notoriously fuzzy. All right, I think we'll call it a day.
And I will see you next time when we be begin with Mary. That's something to look forward to. All right, I'll see you next time. Be safe. Bye-bye.